Hi everybody, welcome to the Overeaters Anonymous 100 um, Pounder Special Focus Meeting. Uh, today is Wednesday, the 26th of January, 2022. And I am absolutely delighted today to welcome not only a friend in recovery, but a really good friend of mine. Her name is Gail N. Gail came to OA in 2008 and um, is now gonna tell you her story. So I'm gonna hand it over to Gail to share her experience, strength and hope. Take it away, Gail. Thank you so much, Rita. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name's Gail and I'm a compulsive overeater from the northwest of England. And I just want to acknowledge and thank Rita for her exceptional and inspirational service in establishing and growing this meeting. Such a fabulous recovery re re resource. And to the team that support Rita, um, you do an absolutely amazing job and, and we are so lucky and blessed uh, to have this fabulous meeting. So thank you. Um, I just want to say a really warm welcome to the newcomers as well. Um, I hope some of what I'm going to share in the next 30 minutes will resonate with you. Uh, but I am going to be talking quite a bit about the steps. So if you knew, it might not necessarily make sense. Uh, but there are people after the meeting that you can talk to. And um, as I say, I hope some of what um, some of what I share will will help you and, and resonate with you. So this is just my story. Um, if you don't identify with what I'm talking about, um, if your disease shows itself different to mine, then please don't be put off because I absolutely guarantee that somebody in these rooms will have your story. Uh, we all have the same disease, but sometimes it manifests itself in different ways. Uh, but you will find somebody who has got your story. I, I'm absolutely sure of that. And the second thing I just want to say is that my experience, strength and hope that I'm sharing today is obviously my very own, um, but it's interwoven with incredible bits of nuggets and wisdom that I have heard in these rooms and other 12 step programs. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, please don't think I'm some sort of guru that's got all this sorted because I am not. Uh, but that is how the circle of recovery works. We share stuff that really resonates with us and we help other people. So just a, a little potted history of my uh, my story. Um, I came into OA back in 2008, and that was after a 20 plus year battle with food. Um, I was a binge eater. Um, that binge eating took me to 309 pounds uh, when I came into OA. I was in my 40s um, at that time, and um, I still managed to function pretty well because I was still relatively young. Um, and I had five years incredible recovery. Um, it was just amazing. I got physical recovery, emotional and spiritual recovery. Um, but then sadly I relapsed and I was in that place for seven years. And I want to say at the start that relapse doesn't have to be part of your story. Um, it was part of mine because I stopped working the program as if my life depended on it but it doesn't have to be everybody's story and I'm not going to talk a huge amount about my relapse today I have done other recordings about relapse that you can listen to um, but that seven year relapse took me to a top weight of 345 pounds and by that time I was in my mid 50s um, I was incredibly incapacitated by this disease and I genuinely thought this disease was going to kill me Thankfully, I came back into OA on the 21st of March 2020, and from that day, I have been abstinent one day at a time, and I've released around £168. Um, so I don't know, Rita, have we got some photos or are we not showing photos? It's entirely up to you. So just um, the kind of the photos that tell my story, um, and, I, and I show these photos not out of vanity, um, I show these photos because this shows that I have got a higher power in my life because it shows what happens when I am not in recovery. It also shows that I have a disease. You know, if I had a choice, then I absolutely wouldn't have done this to myself twice if I had any choice in the matter. Um, and they're just a helpful reminder to me of what happens when I'm in charge. So the first couple of photographs on the top row just show basically I was a healthy body weight as a child and I was a healthy body weight when I got married. Um, and my compulsive overeating didn't really start in earnest until I left home and got married. 
Um, the next picture shows me um, in uh, just before I came to OA uh, in my 40s. Um, I was actually in Paris celebrating my 40th birthday in that picture where I'm wearing black, which was my standard uniform. Um, and I was utterly utterly, utterly miserable. Um, I couldn't find a picture of me at my top weight um, when I um, when I came into OA because I tried to avoid the camera at all costs. And then the final picture on the top row is um, me when I'd been in OA a couple of months on my recovery journey. And that was the, um, the first dress that I had bought from a shop that stocked normal sizes for a very, very long time. Uh, and that was actually taken at my beautiful friend Rita's wedding. Uh, the bottom row, the first picture on the left shows me in recovery uh, from 2008 to 2013. And then the middle two photographs show me in my relapse. Um, and the last photograph on the bottom uh, was just taken uh, a few weeks ago. So yeah, please don't think I'm showing these photographs for the vanity. Um, they, they tell my story um, probably much better than, than my words. Um, so the physical manifestations of the disease were absolutely horrendous. Um, and I know that I have got the capacity and the capability to eat myself to death. There is no way this disease had finished with me at my top weight. I absolutely know that in my heart. And if I was awake, I was either eating or I was being tormented by food thoughts. I tried absolutely everything with the exception of surgery. And I'm sure that would have happened if I hadn't have phoned away. And, you know, every time I tried something new, I genuinely believed it was going to work. I used to think this is it. This is going to be the time when I'm going to sort myself out. Um, I had hundreds and hundreds of self-help books. Um, I tried every form of therapy, alternative therapies. Um, I'm not exaggerating when I say I joined pay and way clubs in excess of 60 times. I was just on this perpetual hamster wheel. And in relapse, I went back to all of those things that I knew didn't work. And the consequence of, of being morbidly obese and having this disease was no match for the power that food had over me. So no matter how horrendous my life was in the food, you know, I got to the point where I couldn't wash myself proper, properly in the shower because there were bits I couldn't reach. Uh, I was in constant pain. I was always aware of my size. If I was sat next to somebody or on public transport, I was always aware that I was taking up a seat and a half. Um, I was ashamed all the time. You know, I'm a healthcare professional by background. I felt like I should have known better. Um, I avoided stirs at all costs because I was completely out of breath. I wore clothes because they had them in my size, not because I liked them. And I had constant heartburn and the most horrendous acid reflux in the night that would literally wake me up because I'd get this kind of acid hit in the back of my throat that would wake me up as if I was choking. And then I'd be up in the night because I couldn't get rid of this sensation that I was choking. And I can remember, I did a lot of my binging in the evening when everybody else had gone to bed. And I can remember thinking, I'm gonna get that awful thing tonight when, I, when I'm asleep. And then I'd think, well, it's okay. I'll just sleep propped up on pillows. That is how insane I was around the food. And I know today that I eat against my will. And I have this very seductive, persuasive, powerful voice in my head that tells me I need to eat that food. And I would swear off, you know, as I said, I did a lot of my eating at night. I would go to bed many, many nights thinking I wasn't going to wake up in the morning. And I'd swear that that was the last time I was going to do this to myself. And I'd get up in the morning with that same resolve. And I'd get into the shower with that same resolve and get ready to go to work. And then I'd be in the kitchen with a carrier bag, just loading it up with loads of sugar, 20, 30 items that I would then just eat on my way to work. And that was that was my life. Um, that was my my life. The emotional and spiritual consequences were equally horrendous. So if you were looking at me from the outside in, you'd probably see somebody who clearly had a weight problem. But you'd probably think, actually, she's kind of got everything together. I was very successful. I got to the top of my profession. Uh, I've been married to a great guy for 35 years. And I always say that that says more about him than me. I've got two beautiful kids. My eldest was, was turned 30 on Sunday. I've got a lovely house. I've got beautiful friends. 
but I absolutely couldn't stand to be me. I was so uncomfortable being me. I was full of fear. I was resentful. I was jealous. I was angry. I was controlling. I was full of shame and self-loathing. Um, absolutely horrendous, it felt like. It really did. And you know, even though I was clearly capable in many areas, you know, you don't get to the top of your profession if you can't do your job. Um, you know, I had a reputation for sorting things. People used to say at work, if we've got a really difficult problem, Gail will sort it. That's what they used to say. But I have to accept that certain foods have the power to bring me to my knees. And I was totally terrified of the power that food had over me. And one of the ways in which I can describe it is it's like kind of holding your breath. So you can hold your breath for a certain amount of time and then your body is going to give you an overwhelming urge to take a breath and you start to breathe again. And that is exactly what binging felt like. I could hold out against it for so long, but eventually I was just going to succumb to the food. And it felt like relapse was was a torment because I knew OA worked. I'd had the solution for five years. I'd had a beautiful recovery life for five years and not being able to tap into that solution was just absolutely soul destroying. And it took me to a really, really dark place. And as I said, you know, relapse does not have to be part of your story. It was part of mine, but that is because I stopped working this program. It doesn't have to be part of yours. So step one for me, admitting I was powerless over food and that my life was unmanageable. Well, the first part of step one was not a problem for me. I, I recognized my powerless over food pretty easily. I could clearly see that food was stronger and more powerful than me. And I'd reached a point with the food where I was absolutely desperate and I did not want to die. And, you know, food had me beat. I was absolutely on my knees and I was doing some work with a sponsee last week. And I said to her, you know, desperation drives our action. And she said, oh, D-D-O-A, desperation drives away. And for me, it's that desperation that drives my action in a way because I really do not want to be back in that place. But the nature of this disease, the, the cunning, powerful, baffling nature of this disease means that food isn't actually the problem. And I'll talk about that in a little while. So the second part of step one, I found that a lot more challenging. You know, was my life really unmanageable? You know, I had this good job. I had the marriage. I had the friends. So how could my, my life be unmanageable? But there were a couple of things that really helped me to recognize the unman unmanageability of my life. The first thing was, you know, I recognized that I couldn't even feed myself properly. If that is not an example of unmanageability, then I don't know what is. And then the second thing, in the big book, um, on page 52, there is a list of unmanageability examples in the big book and they're, they're referred to as the bedevilments. And if you read that in the first person and check where you are, so I was having trouble with personal relationships is one of them. Um, that will give you a good idea of where your unmanageability is. And that really, really helped me. And I ticked every single one of those things on that list. And even today, having been in recovery for 22 months, I can still tick some of those things. And I just share that because it's tempting to think if you've been in recovery for 22 months your life is is great and every day is a bed of roses that isn't the case and 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 this program takes work but if i'm in doubt about my unmanageability and i read that list it really really helps so what i see today is that it's my disordered thinking that brings me to my knees i just use food as the solution to help me deal with all of that so then in step two, coming to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Well, again, I knew that human aid could not help me because I'd failed myself. I couldn't do it. Um, I adore my two kids and I would do absolutely anything for my kids, but I could not stop compulsive overeating for my kids. And you know, none of the consequences are powerful enough to stop me. I've already shared about that. So actually recognizing that I couldn't do it 
again, I found quite easy to accept because, you know, my step one experience was really, really clear that I could not do this. But was I insane? Well, a couple of definitions of insanity. One is I can't distinguish fantasy from reality. That is me in the food. I have this fantasy that I can eat like a normal eater and I will pursue that fantasy to the point of nearly killing myself with excess food because I want to be convinced that I can eat my alcoholic foods, my binge foods like my friends can. And that is not my truth. And then another definition is subject to uncontrollable impulsive behaviors. And again, that really, really speaks to me. So actually, when I think of insanity in those terms, I tick those boxes readily with my minute scale. Thank you. So step two is an asking me to believe in a power. It's asking that I believe that a power so by looking at others in recovery i see that god has restored millions of addicts to sanity so i start to believe it's possible that the same thing will happen to me if i follow the instructions in the big book and there's a brilliant resource at the back of the big book there are 42 personal stories telling how 42 people establish their relationship with god and that is what working the steps give me and there is so much wisdom in those stories I would really recommend that you read them and you know I've had a lot of prejudice that I've had to work through around God um, and today I've been brought to a position where you know for me God the G stands for grace the protection the love and mercy that I am given the O stands for omnipresent because my higher power is everywhere she's in me she's around me she's sat here with me now and direction, the D stands for direction, because I can't manage my own life and left to my own devices, I will eat myself to death. So for me, God is this just beautiful, unconditional source of pure love, beauty, strength and nourishment. And it's all mine. It's all mine. So then in step three, step three is around surrender. And again, you know, looking up definitions of words really help me because what what does surrender mean so one of the definitions is, is surrender is around yielding to the power or control well I'd surrendered to the food many 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 years so this was just about surrendering to something else so my surrender in step three making a decision to turn my will and my life of God as I understand him her it was entirely palatable when it came to food because I, I was willing to give up the food because it absolutely had me beat. But what about every, everything else? Well, that is where I really have to focus my actions today. So, and that's how I grow in my emotional sobriety and my spiritual connection because giving my will, so my thoughts and my life, my actions needs continuous focus. In other words, giving all that I am and all that I have to God needs my daily attention because my ego will tell me I can do this. I've, I've, got, I've got certain aspects of my life. I know I have not got the food, but over here I'm doing pretty okay. But my step one experience shows that I am not okay on my own. And there's a bit at the back of the big book on page 181 and Dr. Bob talks about feeling sorry for you if you have intellectual pride and my intellectual pride you know my own knowledge thinking that I know everything can keep me from accepting what is in this book and I have to completely give up self-sufficiency so thinking that I need no outside help to satisfy my needs or my life I have to give that up and I have to make God, the centerpiece of my life. And I can only do this by using these steps to sort out my disordered thinking because my disordered thinking is the problem. And I either need a hell of a lot of food to live my life or I need a hell of a lot of God. Um, I find analogies really, really powerful. And this just came to me this week when I was working with a sponsee. So um, we have quite a big garden and neither me or my hubby know anything about gardening. No idea how to, to garden, maintain my garden. So we have a really lovely gardener called Norma who has been working with us since last year. And when she came, she said, tell me what you want in your garden. Tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. And I said to her, I've no idea. I don't know anything about gardening. And I said to her, why don't you treat this like your own garden and just do what you do? 
And she really filled up and got quite emotional because she was really overwhelmed that I trusted her with my garden to do whatever she wanted. And she gets so much joy out of maintaining and developing my garden. She's the expert. Why would I tell her what to do? And I just had this thought this week. It's going to make me emotional when I say this. What if it's like that with my higher power? I know nothing of how my life should be, but God does. And what if God feels like Norma and takes untold joy in being trusted with my life? What if that's the case? Norma does a way better job of my garden than I ever could. And my higher power does a way better job of managing my life than I ever could. And I never interfere with what Norma does. I just reap the rewards and have this beautiful garden. But I don't interfere with Norma because I accept that I know nothing about gardening. However, with God, I will sometimes interfere and think I know better. And that's one of the reasons why this is my lifetime's work. So steps four to nine are the steps that unblock this internal channel and give me that connection to the power that's already within me. And I know that because on page 55 in the big book, it tells me that it says deep down in every man, woman and child is a fundamental idea of God. I might block that with worship of other things. That's why I couldn't feel it when I was in the food, but it's there. And there's a, I heard a, a speaker once say that, because that confused me, I was like, well, how can it be a higher power if it's in me? But actually, I heard a speaker say a wave is part of the ocean, but it isn't the ocean. So I'm a part of God and God's a part of me, but I'm not God. And that really, really helped me. But there are some conditions to finding that power within us. And we're told on page 27 that we have to remain willing to maintain a certain simple attitude. So what is the attitude? Again, back to page 55, it says we've got to sweep away prejudice. So I've got to keep an open mind. I've got to think honestly and search diligently within myself. That's how I find that power. So that speaks to me of action, action and more action. And I think that is really, really critical in working this program because I can't think myself into right action. I have to act myself into right thinking. And then I'm told on page 55 that with this attitude, I cannot fail. So it doesn't say, well, you might recover. It says you will recover because that's what the big book tells us. But there's a big but. I have to set aside ideas, emotions and attitudes that I have used for a long, long time to drive and guide my life. And I have to swap them for a new set of ideas and a new set of motives that are gales. But sorry, got that wrong. That are gods and not gales, because when the gales, that's when I end up in trouble. So what does my life look like now? Well, Food is in its place. Um, I've had incredible physical recovery. I am humbled and amazed every single day of this body that I am in that is healthy to all intents and purposes, uh, normal sized and pain free. I never, ever thought I would get there. I focus on the growth steps of 10, 11 and 12. And, and, and why is that? Well, on page 63, I'm told that my higher power will provide what I need, which is this abundant life of recovery. If I do two things, the first one is keep close to my higher power. And the second one is perform my higher powers work well. And that's where steps 10, 11 and 12 come in. So in steps 10, I heard it said, I watch for me, I watch for my defects, my old behaviours, and I clear that channel. In step 11, I watch for God and I fill that channel. And then in step 12, I help others and I empty that channel so it can be refilled again. And I think that's really beautiful. So steps 10 and 11, keep that channel clear so that I can access that power that's already in me to stay recovered. So if I'm blocked by selfishness, fear, dishonesty, anger, or if I lose my humility and think this wonderful life I've got is a gale job, then I am in trouble because on my own, I have no defense against the food thoughts or my emotions. So this is how I maintain the first part of my side of the contract with God, keeping close to my higher power. And it takes continual work to keep my ego at bay. And the longer I'm in recovery, my experiences, the harder I have to work. And I didn't recognize that in my first recovery. And that is why I relapsed. The size of this body bears absolutely no resemblance to the size of my disease. 
I do a lot of work on my character defects. And when I think of my character defects, I think about how I treat others. So treating others like I wouldn't want to be treated. What does it feel like to be on the receiving end of Gail's behavior? And I take that into my quiet time with my higher power. And I ask God to show me the ideals for all the roles that I play in my life as a friend, a mum, a daughter, a wife. Um, and we're told about that in page 69. It's in the sex inventory, but it's brilliant guidance for all of our life. It says that we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal and we ask God to mold my ideals and help me to live up to them. So I pray to be guided towards the ideal. And when I fall short, I make amends and it works. My parents are in the mid eighties and they're amazing but they're getting older. And I was just conscious a few weeks ago that I was a little bit intolerant sometimes with them. And that's coming from a place of fear because I don't want my mum and dad to die. I don't want them to get incapacitated and some selfishness because I know that I'll have an impact on me. So I revisited my ideal as a daughter and I just read that before I see my mum and dad and I just pray to God to help me to be that person. And it happens. It, it, it's just amazing. And I need to continue to identify anything that is coming between me and God, because I only have a daily reprieve against this disease. And that is based on how spiritually fit I am. And it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter if I'm grumpy. I can still be spiritually fit because spiritual fitness is about the actions I take. It's about not ripping my husband's head off his shoulders just because I'm in a grump. So you know, for me, other substances have been down for a very, very long time, as well as the food. But at this moment in time, I've got some unmanageability around money and compulsive spending. So with my sponsor, I'm working on that because I can't have anything that comes in between me and my higher power. And then the second part of the contract is step 12, you know, working with others, having had this spiritual awakening and trying to apply these principles in all my affairs. And step 12 for me is, is, one of the biggest gifts of the program it's just absolutely beautiful to work with others and to just help other people recover and to be helpful in other aspects of my life as well so I'm sure my time's nearly up so I'm just going to finish with whenever I share I, I just usually finish with these two quotes from the big book because for me they just really really sum it up so the first thing is to never ever lose hope and it tells us that on page 50 you know I was totally hopeless um particularly in my relapse I genuinely thought I was done for um and on page 50 it says this power has in each case accomplished the miraculous the humanly impossible and that is the only explanation for what has happened in my life you know on the 20th of March 2020 I was you know, up to my neck in food, I could not put the food down. And the day after I was able to put the food down and that wasn't me. I got to a meeting. I said to Rita, can I just commit my food to you till I find a sponsor? And that's what I did. And the food has been in its place ever since. And that is absolutely not me. And then the second thing is on page 199 and it says, I won't have to drink. So I won't have to compulsively overeat. If I remember one simple thing, to keep my hand in the hand of God. And I find my truth in the big book. There is just one line in the big book that I don't agree with. And it says, lend him a copy of your book when you're working with other people. Well, this is my big book. This is my Bible. It's got so much wisdom, as you can see. I'm not lending anybody my big book. I will buy them a copy willingly, but I'm not lending anybody my big book. It doesn't go out of my sight. That's the only bit minutes, of the book that I don't agree with. Thank you. So today and every day, I really pray that I never forget who I am. You know, I am Gail, a compulsive overeater, and OA is my tribe, and that's where I belong. And I usually finish my prayers in the morning with a simple prayer that says, God, please don't let me mess my recovery up today, because I have the ability to do that. And I don't want to trade this amazing life that I have got for anything. I do not want to go back into that dreadful place with the food. And, you know, one day at a time, if I follow the instructions in that book, the magic just happens. Um, and I am so, so grateful. Thank you so much for letting me share today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Gail. What a, what a big message of depth and weight. I'm just going to read out a little thing that we did together, actually, on a, on a um, uh, can't think of the word, thing we did together, workshop. 
<laughs> and it's from a late start on page 543 in the big book. It says, as it is, AAOA has filled my days with friends, laughter, growth, and the feeling of worth that is rooted in constructive activity. My faith in and contact with my higher power shines more brightly than I dreamed it could. Those promises I thought were impossible are a viable force in my life. I am free to laugh all of my laughter, free to trust and be trusted, free to both give and receive help. I am free from shame and regret, free to learn and grow and work. I have left that lonely, frightening, painful express train through hell. I have accepted the gift of a safer, happier journey through life. <laughs>